Okay, so we were talking a little bit about the network and the network components, a little bit about uh, uh, performance metrics. So let's continue. So um, there are how data flows through this network over a link um, has three main uh, classifications. I would like to say. I, I would uh, say. Um, so if we have a sender and a receiver like this, and data only goes from the sender to the receiver, so there's only data flow in one direction here, this is called simplex. Okay? Uh, so it's one direction, and an, an, an example of this is a regular TV broadcast that you get through the antennas, right? So there's a uh, TV transmission tower here somewhere in Gothenburg, transmits out signals to the TVs, okay? So data only goes from the tower to the TVs not the other way around. So that's simplex. If we have duplex, that is when data goes in both directions, which is the more interesting part, I would like to say. So we will treat more mainly when we have uh, data going both directions. This is called duplex. And then there are two subcategories of duplex. Half duplex, meaning that uh, data goes in one direction first and then goes in another direction first. So one has the forward and backwards direction needs to share the same medium and it cannot use the medium at the same time. One has to take turns. So uh, a normal half duplex um, uh, system is, it is bidirectional but only one way at a time. So for instance, one example of this is Wi-Fi. So a laptop that transmits information cannot uh, receive information at the same time as it's transmitting. Okay, but data can go back and forth to the network. Uh, Walkie-talkie is another type of half-duplex thing. Uh, full duplex is bidirectional, but simultaneously. So data can go in, in this direction and this direction at the same time without disturbing each other. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, an example. This is uh, modern Ethernet. So if you have, uh, this is an Ethernet switch and this is an Ethernet uh, uh, cable, uh, a flavor of it. So when I plug it in and I plug in something else on the other side, data can go simultaneously in, bo in both directions. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions on this? I, it's not rocket science, right? So, okay. Um, connection types, point-to-point uh, -point and uh, multi-point connections. So, a point-to-point -point connection is when transmission is heard by a single device. So we have a transmitter here and a receiver here, and there is a link here. And the only, uh, um, the only other node which can hear this message is a single other node. Okay, so point-to-point, -point. Uh, as opposed to, in this case, point-to-multipoint, or just short multipoint, where a transmission from say this mainframe, goes over this link, but there are several receivers connected to this link, and all of them hear the uh, outgoing message here. Okay. Uh, we continue. And now, uh, network topologies here. So we basically have two major uh, extreme cases of network topologies, something called mesh and something called star. Uh, a mesh network is when the, the nodes here, we have five nodes in this case, are all connected, fully connected. Okay? Which means that from each node there is a, a dedicated uh, connection to all other nodes. So in this case we have uh, n nodes and in this case n is equal to 5. Um, then the other, uh, okay, um, so if we concentrate here on the mesh network here, how many links do we need in order to uh, connect n nodes? Uh, yeah, so n minus 1 is definitely part of this, but that's not enough, right? So for each node, we need uh, n minus 1 links, but then we have n nodes also. So n minus 1 times n is the total number of links, but then we have counted the, the links twice, so we need to divide this by 2. Okay. 
So these are the number of links required and this is roughly, as you see, roughly n squared. You know, uh, okay, n squared over 2 if you like. But it, the, the important thing is that the number of links required is quadratic in the number of nodes. Okay. Um, so that's how many links which are needed. So what is good about uh, such a, which is, you know, it's not nice because this could become a very large number. But what is nice with the mesh network is that it's robust. So suppose we would like to transmit the message from this uh, sender, from this sender to this destination. Then we would normally transmit this over the de dedicated link. That seems to make sense. But then what happens if there is a, you know, road construction, there is an excavator that digs off the fiber channel. It happens all the time. Okay. Then uh, uh, the system, the, uh, the network can figure this one out and then route the message this way instead. Okay. So the mesh network is robust towards n uh, link failures. Okay. Um, however, it's also expensive because we need uh, many links. Okay. So that's one extreme of a network topology. The other extreme is the star topology here. Um, what it means then is that we have here n devices. Okay, so in this case, n is equal to four. Um, and then each device is then connected to a central connecting device in the middle here, which is not an end destination, it's just a part of the network. Okay, so this could be a hub or it could be a switch like this one, for instance. We will not get into what is the difference between a switch and a hub right now. But we'll talk more about that later on. But there is something in the network that looks like this. And there is a number of input ports to this one where one can connect stuff into. So in this case, we have uh, four of these connected then to this central uh, connecting device. So here the number of links we need is ex exactly equal to the number of devices. So uh, here we see that uh, the number of links, okay, so maybe I should write this out. Number of links is equal to n, okay? So we see that n, it, it grows linearly with the number of devices, but here it grows quadratically, okay? So when adding more and more of these nodes, for each new node, we just need to add one more link, okay? So a few links, so that's good. What's bad about this? If the central device breaks, the communication is gone. Excellent. Right. So, single point of failure. If this breaks, the whole thing goes down. So it's very, not very robust. Okay. So, what do we want? We want something with few links, because that's cheaper. But we also want something which is robust. Okay. So pick your poison. Right. You have to invest something to get robustness. It's not for free. Um, now, thinking about this, how do you believe that the internet is, uh, the network topology for the internet is? Is it a mesh or is it a star? How many for mesh? Hands up. How many for star? A few. How many for both? <laughs> Sorry, I should have given the alternative before, right? But but it's it's a it's a hybrid, of course, right? Because uh, I don't know how many devices there are on the internet, but there are certainly billions, and there is not a cable between every device and every other device, right? You know, can you imagine what kind of cable bundle that would be? This is not enough, by the way. Okay. So and then so it's a it's a it's a it's a hybrid between these two things. One would say like we we have extra links to get robustness, but we would like to invest them at good places, right? In order to overall network to be reasonably robust. Okay. Um, we have uh, uh, we could implement. Um, 
Okay, so this is about mesh and star. And then we have basically two types of uh, um, uh, two extreme cases again on how to do things. And uh, in, in the bottom here we have uh, a bus. Okay. These buses are, are usually, sometimes in the past we used buses in order to connect uh, computers with each other. It's not so common today. But in the, in the old days it was done like this. And basically what, uh, what one had here was a coaxial cable. So this black thing is a coaxial cable. And there was some uh, termination at the ends here with uh, suitable impedance. Okay. Uh, if uh, one wants to connect the device to this cable, one basically drilled a hole in it and put in a, something called a tap in this uh, cable. Uh, and then uh, the computer was attached to this in the sense that the computer can s transmit and receive signals which are uh, found on this uh, coaxial cable. And if uh, this is the sender and this is the destination, say, uh, the sender would send out a signal here that would propagate this way and propagate this way. It would then be absorbed by the, uh, the terminations at the end of the cable and then it could be then picked up by all devices which are on the bus. Uh, now, since the, 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 the signal should go to the, uh, it goes to the destination, but it also goes to everyone else. Okay. Uh, another way to do things is when we have a destination and, uh, sorry, a source and a destination like this, and we use rings, and these devices here, called repeaters, are actually where we have an input port and an output port. And a message that goes into the input port is then inspected by the repeater. And if it's uh, destined, if, uh, if that message should go to the computer that this repeater is connected to, it's transmitted up to the computer. Otherwise, it's passed along the line. Okay. So in this case, the transmission of this signal will go down to the repeater and then be pumped out in this direction. It will go here and then goes to this repeater. The repeater will look at this and say, oh, hey, this was not to me, it should go to some other computer, and then send it out along its way on the, on the ring, where it reaches this repeater, and then it's delivered to the destination. But it's not, it is not transmitted further, right? So the difference between the ring and the bus here is that the bus, everybody hears the message, and in the ring, it's just passed along the segments of the ring, which is needed in order to find its destination. So these buses were an early example of Ethernet. You also find buses inside computers and so forth. Rings you find uh, found also in the early days connecting uh, computers, now not so common. But you find rings uh, where you have fiber rings around the city, for instance, uh, for these wide area networks uh, that we will talk a little bit about later on. OK, we continue. So networks. There are, we can classify networks very broadly into two classes, local area networks and wide area networks. So local area networks are typically physically small networks. So, you know, the distance between the two uh, nodes which are uh, furthest uh, uh, apart in this network is limited. I don't know, a kilometer maybe or something like that, a couple of hundred meters, I don't know, but it's limited. And these local area networks are typically privately owned. Okay. So in my house, I have a local area network. I bought all the stuff for it. And I put, put it together, right? It's mine. Um, a wide area network, on the other hand, is something which is long distance. And it's owned by telephone companies, or telcos. So some type of internet uh, service provider or telephone company or something like that. So when data leaves my home and goes out through my fiber modem, it goes over to a, uh, a, a network which is owned by my internet service provider. Right. And it can go, uh, of course, that data can go all over the globe. Okay. So uh, a typical uh, lawn could look something like this. We have a number of devices attached to this. These devices we call hosts. Okay, and with the name host, we mean basically that we have some application software running on this, 
and it's at the end of the network. Okay. Uh, and then uh, these are then attached to a medium, and this is uh, you know all classical Ethernet. So this uh, is what it, uh, looked in the past. Now in the in today it looks more like this, where we have hosts and we have a uh, Ethernet cable connected into a switch. So here we have a switch, and for each computer we have a connection like this. Right? So this is a modern LAN, modern switched e Ethernet. So we have one cable per this. Okay. You can also think of a Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi is also a LAN where instead of cables we have uh, we transmit uh, things over the air through radio signals. Uh, wide area network is you know it's it's typically different technology. Uh, could be a big fiber uh, bundle, for instance. Uh, and uh, it could be, for instance, a point-to-point -point like this. Or it could be something which is a switch network where you have mesh, uh, mesh uh, ideas here to have uh, redundancy and therefore reliability. And so basically there is some connection from a network and it goes into this wide area network and there is some device fiber modem or whatnot, and then there is a, a fiber here, for instance, and then there is another device and then out to the next network. So in the simplest case, we would have like a home network here with regular switched ethernet. This would be then the fiber modem, then there is a fiber, goes somewhere, and then over to some other place here. Okay, the simplest case would look something like this. A more complicated case is when your, your network goes into here, and then there are multiple output lines from these uh, connecting devices and build a more complicated structure for this. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? Okay. So, local area network, short, typically short distance, privately owned. Wide area network, typically long distance and owned by somebody else. Okay. Uh, a, pro a service provider of some sort. Uh, internet works or internets, what are those? Those are uh, networks or networks. Okay. And the biggest internet we know is the internet with big I, the one we use every day, right? But there are other smaller internets out there which are not public, for instance. So if you have a, a company which has a, um, say, an office here in Gothenburg and then an office, say, in Stockholm, so East Coast, West Coast, they all have their local network in the office premises. But of course, you would like to communicate over this, and you would perhaps would like to do that in a, uh, in a private network. Right? You don't want to go with the public net, or maybe, OK. Then you can interconnect that with a wide area network, which you buy the service from uh, a provider of some sort. Okay. So we have a local area network. That local area network is connected through a router to a wide area network that goes into another router and then out to this local area network again. Here, I would like maybe to make a, a comment here. Uh, router and switch and so forth are names uh, that has a certain meaning, but uh, if you look in different books and different sources, you would get different definitions of what, what is a router and what is a switch. Try to Google that and you will get, you know, 10 answers. Okay, all of them are correct in one way or another. Uh, so uh, I would try to not be so strict in, in uh, distinguishing between these two, but we'll try to stick with the, uh, the definitions which are in the course book. Now, this happens to be a switch in this case, okay? Um, and, uh, but, you know, if, if I could have, this could have also been a router. You cannot tell from the outside whether it's a switch or a router. You have to look a little bit on the uh, connections here. For instance, if there is, say, say LAN, 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 and VAN, for instance, is typically a router, or it, it, it will be a router in the way that I uh, define it in the course. But more about that later. Okay, so if this would be a router, then there will be one port here that goes to the VAN and a number of ports which goes to the incoming computers which are on the local area network. Okay, um, uh, one can have more complicated networks, of course. Uh, so here we have uh, a residential 
local area network, which consists of only one computer. Um, uh, and then it is connected to a wide area network through a point-to-point -point, uh, wide area network. So this might be your fi fiber cable or something like this. Or maybe it's a telephone cable, I don't know. And then there is another modem and then pops into the switch one here. And the other things are connected through other ones like this. So we have here a wide area network, another wide area network, one here, one here, and one, two, three LANs. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, now, switching types. Um, networks can use, broadly speaking, two types of switching strategies. Either they are circuit switched or they're packet switched. So let's start with circuit switched. So in a circuit switch network, and the classical example of this is a telephone network. So these are telephones, and here we have telephones also. So how does a telephone network work? Um, well, at least in, in, the, in the old days, you had uh, uh, telephones which are connected with wires. So let's think about that now. So basically, when you make a call, uh, you uh, in these type of networks, you have a telephone here, and you would like to use the service. You lift up the hook, okay? Uh, and then you, di you, you listen in the hook, and there, there is a beep. And the beep basically tells that the network is uh, uh, available. And then you punch in your uh, destination address, that is the telephone number you want to talk to. The network looks at this telephone number and then finds a path through the network to connect you with the other phone. <coughs> Next thing that happens is that there will be a ring signal at the destination telephone. And if somebody is at that uh, telephone, he or she will lift up the hook there and then say hello. Okay. What I described now from the, from the time when you take up the hook until the other person takes up the hook, this is called um, the setup uh, phase, where the network finds a path through the network and reserves resources for this connection to hold. And this is done before any information has passed through the network. Any information which is user information. So nobody has spoken yet, right? And then the conversation starts until we're done. And then one of the end nodes hangs up, or maybe both hangs up. When this happens, the network realizes, okay, so there is no more uh, need for a phone call, and then release the resources which have been reserved for this call to happen. Okay, so there are a number of phases, three phases in a circuit switch network. So circuit switch network, there's a setup phase, and then there is an information transfer phase, and then there is a teardown phase. In the setup, the network reserves a path through the network and some resources associated with this. And then these are then uh, reserved for that call. So for instance, if this is the, uh, the initiating telephone and this is the uh, phone that uh, uh, receiving phone, there, there is first a, some communication here locally with this switch where you lift up the hook, you hear a beep and then type in the, the final address, the telephone number. Then the switch together with the other switches finds a way through the network. Perhaps it finds a way like this. And then this network, this path is fixed, doesn't change until the phone call is over. Once this phone call is over, this path is released and can be reused by somebody else. Okay. Now, before this uh, um, uh, telephone call is over, maybe this phone is calling this phone and then uh, uh, negotiate with the switch and maybe this goes over this line here, like this. Okay. So what happens now if we have a third phone call like this? Well, 
there's still communication like this, and then it needs to, uh, the switch needs to figure out the path here. Uh, the good thing is that uh, these um, uh, lines that connect switches here are typically able to handle many calls, right? Uh, could have many cables in it, for instance, or it could be some other technology that uh, it can handle many calls. So it could be like this goes also over this one, right? So it's not necessarily so that uh, there is only one call that can be handled by link. It's a high capacity line here, yeah, typically. Okay. But at some point, the capacity of that line would be reached, and then no more calls can be put through. Which means that, you know, suppose that this is the case, and then the fourth telephone uh, picks up the line, and then it will basically get a busy tone. The network is unable to handle this request. So there is a blocking thing here. Okay. So uh, a circuit switch network has this um, capability where it reserves resources for the call and keep it fixed for the call, but then after, uh, which means that sometimes uh, the network cannot provide the service because all the resources are, are, are occupied. Um, but those who have gotten a connection will get a connection with the quality they have uh, requested. Um, and if the network is, is uh, overloaded, then one has to wait until resources become available. That is, somebody hangs up. Um, a um, a uh, characteristic of these type of networks is that switches doesn't store data typically. Uh, the data, once, once we have uh, established a path through the network, then the switches just transmits the, the, uh, the packet that goes in, goes out immediately. Okay. There is no processing locally in the switch, except uh, identifying what uh, output line it should go to. Uh, this has low and stable delays but potentially low network utilization. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by this is that once you make a call, you have, you have dialed the call and you know, this one has taken the hook off, that one has taken the hook off. Then you start to talk. But what happens if you somehow decide, you don't talk, you decide to go and have a, or somebody call, uh, you know, for some reason you're quiet for some time, both ends then that means that there is no data going through the network, but you still have reserved network resources. Okay, you have occupied this path through the network, which means that uh, in that case, no data goes through the network, even though the network is busy. So this is low network utilization. Okay. These resources, which are not occupied in the network, cannot be used for something else. It's been reserved for this phone call. So potentially, we have low network utilization in this case. Um, so what can we do instead? Well, the other option is to have a packet switch network. Okay. And here, um, the data, first of all, are packets. So these small gray things here are packets. So packets come from the different datas, and they're put into a queue into this router and then uh, they are put out on uh, uh, output lines from output ports from this router along its way to the destination. So packets are received and buffered or stored in the routers, and then they are forwarded when the output link is available. Okay, so what does that mean? So for instance, suppose that this is a router. It's not a router, but suppose it was, right? So we have a number of ports here. So there might be a packet coming in on this port and this port. These are queued here and then put out on the appropriate ports whenever these ports are available. Okay. So data comes in, are stored, queued inside the device and then put out uh, through the device on the appropriate output ports. Okay. So um, how do we figure out which port to figure this uh, to, uh, to output? Um, um, packets contains addresses. So a packet that comes into a router tells, uh, has a final destination address. And this final destination address is then used to figure out which output port you should send it to. So for instance, if this computer would like to uh, send a packet to this computer, 
the first data packet that comes in here would have the destination address of, of uh, this um, um, end destination, and that packet might go this way, like this. So that's the first packet. Now, the second packet has the same destination address, but for some reason, the network decides it's better to send it this way. That's fine. Okay. So consecutive packets, even to the same destination, doesn't necessarily need to take the same path. And that is good because maybe this router is extra busy at the moment when the red packet is arrived, so it's better to send it the other way. Or there could be some uh, failure inside the network. So we adopt the transmission of the packets accordingly. So one characterization of these packet switch networks is that packets for transmitter receiver pair can go over different network paths. If it's circuit switch, it always goes the same path. Okay. Packet needs to contain addresses for this to work. And good utilization of these network links is possible because uh, as soon as there is a free space on a link, you can transmit this, the packet. But it also might be that uh, many packets queue up somewhere in, 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 a, in a router, which means that the delays increases. Or in worst case, uh, the number of packets coming into the router are more than the memory storage in the router, and packets are simply dropped, thrown away. Okay. So uh, even though we have good utilization of the network links, we have potentially high and variable latency, and sometimes we also have packet drops. Okay, um, so this is the first part, which is a little bit tricky. I don't know what you think is tricky, but I know that there is a little bit of confusion around these subjects when you see it for the first time. So this might be a good idea to uh, take a question or two around this. If there are no c questions, there are two possible reasons for this. Either is this is super simple, and you really don't have any questions, or it's so difficult that you don't have any questions. So I will assume it's the former, right? Okay. Okay. So let's continue then. Uh, example of a message switching network is the telegraph, or um, a telegraph. I don't know if you, it's a historical device, but basically you had telegrams with your message. It's sort of like a, a uh, you know, the, the sender puts down some words on a, on, a, on a message on a piece of paper, and this is the telegram. Brings it to the telegraph station. Telegraph station uh, asks, okay, what is the final destination of this? So the telegram contains the payload, the message, and the final destination, okay? Then uh, uh, the the so the a message will contain three parts: the receiver address, the sender address, who is this from, and then the user message. Then this is then transmitted through digital transmission. It doesn't matter if it's digital, but it happens to be like this: it's Morse code, dashes and dots, over some line, and then it goes to a receiving station. At the receiving station, uh, one decodes this message. So one receives and then store it. So you receive it, you put it on paper. And then you look at this piece of paper and say, okay, uh, is this, uh, should this be uh, transmitted to the next station or is this station the final destination? Okay. No, so this station is not the final destination. And you figure out, okay, it should be this person that would you know, send the message over to the next uh, receiving station. And then, so it's forwarded to the next station. Uh, of course, somebody who sits and then uh, keys this um, uh, Morse code transmitter has many messages going off the o over that line at the same time. Um, so messages are multiplexed over these transmission lines. And in the message, there is also something that allows the receiver to figure out when is the start of a telegram and where is the end of the telegram. And this is called framing. Um, so all of these things 
messages, that they contain addresses and user messages, that there is message switching at the receiving station, which means receive and store and then forward. These are typical things that happens in a, a packet switch network. Uh, multiplexing here basically means that the capacity of the lines which are inside the network can carry sem uh, many messages at the same time. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes, good. Thank you. I don't know if it's like this question mm. yet, but I'm wondering about how the path is decided for the messages. Ah, okay. So the, the, how the messages, uh, how the path is decided, uh, it will come a little bit later. But that is a big problem in itself, and that's called the routing problem. How to figure out the best path through the network. Sometimes it's uh, pretty obvious and sometimes it's not. But we'll return to that. So we just assume now that uh, the route has somehow been determined. Um, we talked about this uh, circuit switching with the telephone, so I won't go through this again. Uh, but basically here, the difference now is that before any data actually passes through the network, a network path is decided and resources for this is um, uh, allocated. Um, I will actually skip this. Let me see where we are. Okay. I think, I think, I think we do this, I think we do the lecture quiz here, so and this is nothing you get points for, right, so it's just for me to understand where you are. So uh, the, this telegraph system, uh, so uh, it's a yes or no question here, so before the telegram is sent, the route from uh, the end station is determined, is this yes or no? I give you ten seconds. <coughs> and so how many for yes? How many for no? Good. So that's true, right? So actually the route is not predetermined. It could be dynamically handled. And this is to, uh, you know, for various reasons you would like to have different paths. Um, failures and things like this. So what is true for the telephone system? Um, before the caller can start talking, the route from the end station is determined. How many for yes? And how many for no? Okay, great. So this, that's, that's great. So then th this is seems to be super clear, right? So this is packet switching, this is circuit switching. Now, packet, packet transmission, transmission of uh, pieces of information, can for sure be sent over circuit switched network. Okay. So the, the actual messages that we transmit is not, if it's a packet, it doesn't necessarily say mean that it goes over a packet switched network. We can send uh, packets ov also over circuit switched networks. In fact, that's what we did in the old days when we had telephone modems. Okay. Then we transmitted uh, internet traffic over telephone lines using the telephone system, which is circuit switched. Okay. Um, now, consider a system where we have n, n stations, hosts, that would like to communicate. Which network topology is the most economical, mesh or star? How many for mesh? How many for star? Star is right here. Okay, fewest number of lines. Okay, so uh, this type of questions is sort of indicative of what you will find at the quiz, except that there will be five uh, um, uh, uh, alternatives. Right. So it will be fairly basic questions. That if you can handle those then you're in good shape. If you can't handle those, you're in bad shape. Right. 
Now, since it's a multiple choice, you could have an error in your, uh, you know the answer, but you still thought, I mean, it's like when you take your driver's license. There are many answers which are almost correct, but there are one which is the most correct, right? So, yeah. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more thing. Uh, so I will just leave you with this. Uh, an example of a computer network and a protocol, okay? So we will talk a bunch about protocols. And protocols are these rules that tells us how communication is, is done. Uh, how the communicating parties should interact. And you know about protocols already. You know the internet protocol, IP. Transmission control uh, protocol, perhaps you heard of it, TCP. Hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP. And simple mail transfer, uh, transfer protocol, SMTP, and so forth. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I used all of these today. You probably did too. Right. So these are quite common, and they do different things for us. And we'll talk a little bit what they do. Um, um, I'll, I'll just skip that. And I think, let's see, I think it's time instead of, of uh, going into the next chunk, we'll save that until uh, next lecture. So we'll stop here today. And we'll stop here, but a few uh, key things. If you're not registered for the course, you have to register quickly or send Schreiber uh, uh, an email, okay? We will meet next time on Thursday morning at eight o'clock. So we have two lectures in a row, which is exhausting for everyone, including myself, right? But uh, let's be there bright and early on Thursday. Bring a cup of coffee, I will bring one for sure. And then we will do that. And then we have one more lecture on Friday. So this week we will have four lectures. So it will be quite intense at the beginning. It will be a little bit less intense uh, later on. But the, the reason why we do a lot of lecture now in the beginning is to make uh, so much headway that you can get started on the project, which is good. Uh, but anyways, so let's see, uh, let's uh, uh, see you guys on, on Thursday morning, hopefully. All right. <laughs>